The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you, Tally Olson. Welcome to the second edition of Dodger Baseball in the Zone with Jim Smiley. I'm Ralph Tycho, Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and it's my pleasure to bring Jim back. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great, Ralph. Always good to talk a little baseball with you. I love doing it. You're, uh, you're opin- you have opinions without being opinionated, and right. um, I like that very much. Um, you're a fine addition to the, the network, and um, let's talk a little Dodger. Um, I, you have stuff to talk about um, after this. Um, your Cooperstown adventures are incredibly interesting. But let's start with um, spring training rundown. What's going on in Dodgerville? Well, you know, it's it's a different year than the past few years because uh, the Dodgers didn't make any great off-season splashes and. Uh, also had a few guys leave. So you've you've got Trey Turner who's gone from the top of the order and, and from shortstop, and they really felt like Gavin Lux was ready to step in there and fill those shoes, and they turned the position over to him, and then uh, he hurt himself, and he's, he's out for the year. So the Dodgers are really um, facing question marks for the first time in a few years. Okay, any trades on, on the horizon to kind of fill shortstop? What I really like about the front office is that they're not reactionary. And the 162-game season is really, obviously, the cliche is more of a marathon than a sprint. And I think they're quite comfortable in a wait-and-see mode to see how things go. Um and I don't think there's any trade, and I don't think there's any sense of desperation with the expanded playoff um, pairings and such. There's every reason to believe that this team will still be standing in October and much improved by then from transactions and trades. But right now it's it's better not to deal from desperation or or to worry about things that, that don't need concern yet. So I'm sure they're keeping their eyes open, but – Nothing on the imminent horizon. What motivated the decision not to bring back Trey Turner, or um, was it Trey Turner's decision? Well, I think you're you're really that's a smart way of putting it because a lot of fans assume that maybe it was the Dodgers in command there, and and if they wanted him, they'd have him. But Trey Turner's an East Coast guy; he prefers the East Coast. And that was better for for he and his people. And I think that the Dodgers also didn't want to commit to that kind of a uh, long-term salary and commitment. Um, I really believe that they they see saw Gavin Lux as capable and more of a traditional shortstop, where he'd be completely competent in the field, offer you some decent uh, help at bat but nothing that would be Trey Turner, who's probably the best shortstop in the game. Um, right. I really trust that front office. There are so many steps ahead, and they're not only steps ahead as far as this season, but they've got everything kind of mapped out for the seasons to come as well. Now, the Dodgers were famous for uh, hiring a bunch of people in the analytic um, department, to uh, to arrange for the shifting and what have you. How is the new rule going to affect them? And does that um, take away the advantage that they had um, over other teams by being so progressive and um, putting so much money into... into uh, uh, I, I call it advanced scouting, basically. Um, but is this going to 
uh, kind of neutralize that and um, put everybody, everybody on a par? No, not at all. The the Dodgers, as you said, are at the forefront of analytics and and crunching through that data and using that data to formulate strong game plans. I think you'll see them continue to be on the forefront with positioning within the confines of the rules. And you could see some interesting things as far as an outfield alignment because there are no rules as far as where guys have to be positioned on the grass. It will also benefit the Dodgers, chiefly Max Muncy, because he's a guy who, if there was no shift, he'd be really aided by that. So I think that that they'll continue to, you know, the, the beautiful thing about the front office, they don't have any kind of, oh, shucks idea that the shift is gone. It's more, okay, these are the rules. How do we thrive here? Where do we expose things? How do we apply our analytics? What do the, what does the data say? How do we best move forward? And I, I have really good confidence in their front office. They're, it's not just analytical guys. It's, it's guys who were steeped in baseball. Even the president of baseball operations, Andrew Friedman, he uh, you know, was the center fielder for Tulane, and his dad played Division I baseball at Tulane as well. They're going to be they're going to be just fine. Good, good for them. Uh, bad for anti Dodger fans like myself, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, it's great that San Diego's doing so much. You've got a uh, nephew of of former Dodger owner Peter O'Malley down there, and he's kind of gone all in. And I think that he sees a window to build his legacy in the next few years with the roster he's got. And it's interesting. I've, I've kind of evolved as a fan as, as any good Dodger fan, I grew up hating the giants and, and having preferences, but now I just root for the Dodgers and also root for things that are good for baseball, like the moves the Padres have made. Well, that's uh, interesting because I was a New York giant fan and after doing this podcast for 10 years and uh, getting to know the people from all the organizations, I, uh, I look back at the Brooklyn Dodgers with very fond memories, and I hated, right. hated them as a kid. So um, that's an evolution of fandom and, um, I guess, growing up. But and the Yankees in, included in my thinking, um, I have fond memories of those teams and those players, uh, the competition that they provided, the Giants. Um, it, it was wonderful. It was wonderful years to um, to have in the memory bank. So um, absolutely, I, I I guess, and I'm, I'm thinking mostly. Uh, I, about to release um, my second book on um, audiobook uh, this time. And it's Love and Baseball When We Were 12 and Innocent. And I've gone back and had interviews with some of the most passionate fans, um, players, former players. Um, and the last interview... I'm doing is with um, uh, with Irene Hodges, Gill's mm-hmm. daughter, and um, it, it just were um, discussing memories, and uh, it didn't matter that I was a Giant fan; um, the memories are still the same. The ballparks, the uh, the fans uh, around you, it, it's just great growing up a, a baseball fan. Let's put it that way. And um, so my point is that uh, with Irene, her memories of, of the Dodgers coincide with mine, and I, um, I, I didn't particularly like them at the time, but I have such fond memories and I think we might have talked about this before. Walter O'Malley, who took the the Dodgers from New York, and it was a horrible sin. In a way, 
what he did with Roy Campanella to honor him, um, turning out the lights, or it was the, the Coliseum. Um, it just it brought the Dodgers and Giants together in in a sense because um, the players that we worshipped weren't necessarily the ones that um, wore black and orange or blue blue and orange at the time. So uh, blue and white, actually. Anyway, um, I love being a baseball fan, and I know you do too. Definitely. Definitely. And, and you know, the, they say that the golden era of baseball is that of our youth. And we can remember guys that we didn't like or, or we were upset with, but I think it's exactly as you said, you, you mature a little bit and you realize that your love of the Giants can't exist without the opponents and without the guys that you were worried about and, and how things were going. You know, I got a question for you. Who was your favorite guy growing up? Um, you have to say, I have to say Willie comes naturally but um, Alvin Dark was the shortstop of my uh, favorite team, um, the Giants. And there's something about rooting for the shortstop of um, of your team, uh, the center of it all. And um, until later when I grew up, and that's part of losing your innocence, and um, you realize that he was, he, like everybody else, is gray, flawed, you know, the, this, that, and the other thing. And you don't necessarily, when I look back, I think of them on the field. I don't think of the, their ideology or later managerial experiences and, um, and, uh, racism and uh, all of that. So, um, yeah, uh, as a, a kid, Alvin Dark, but, I mean, Willie, it's almost like everybody had a root for Willie. And I have a lot of Dodger fans who tell me that um, they, too, uh, felt, you know, they were big Duke Snyder fans, this or this and that, but... Um, they could be objective and realize that Willie was Willie and um, nothing like him. So, you know, it's, um, it's interesting that you mention all of this. Of course, uh, Vin Scully called Willie the, the greatest player he had ever seen. And Scully's boyhood favorite, of course, was a New York giant in uh, mm -hmm. Mellot. Right. He grew up a giant. Fan. Right. <laughs> And, uh, you know, from what I understand, he wanted to do his last broadcast in San Francisco before he retired um, in honor of the Giants. So he was uh, a Dodger employee and a Dodger lover and all this. But I think deep down, um, I'm not, I can't speak for him obviously, or no one can at this point. But uh, I think when he uh, thought, woke up in the morning and thought of the old times, Melot was uh, still there, he, even though um, he had, you know, there was Sandy and, and all that. And we may have talked about this. The greatest announcing job I've ever heard was... Um, Vin doing a Sandy, I, I heard the last inning of it, um, a Sandy perfect game against the Cubs. And, um, two and two to Harvey Keen. Oh, yes, yes. Um, wow. Yeah, um, what uh, terrific memories he brought. And the nice part is, in the day and age we live in, you can pick up some of these old games, and I do often, um, and um, relive them on YouTube. Uh, on, on the radio, they have some World Series games that are um, 
I'm thinking of the, of the 52 war, World Series in particular, where they a complete game uh, televised. Um, so it's a gem. It, it you is. Know, it, was, it is. It was really neat. Uh, back in about 2014, it must have been. I found an old Wheaties ad of Mel Ott from Scully's childhood. And at that time I was still covering the Dodgers and I brought it to the press box. He would come by the dinner table there. We would, I'd always have dinner with the former Dodger pitcher, Joe Moeller and the stadium organist, Nancy B. Heffley, and then would stop by and. and The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.